Let me officially welcome folks uh, here at the Church of the Good Samaritan. We're thrilled to be hosting this event today. We care deeply about um, things that affect our neighbor here at this congregation and in, in all churches, I think. And we want to think deeply on how do we best love our neighbors near and far. With that, I'm going to hand the mic over to uh, Dr. Carol Cunningham. Thank you so much for being here to think about a wonky, complicated, difficult topic that impacts all of us in ways that we may not realize. To do that, I'm going to share some of my own story. As I do, I ask you to consider what in your story has prepared and challenged you to think about justice and what it means to love your neighbor. I grew up in a church tradition that took scripture very, very seriously. I earned my first Bible when I was in third grade by memorizing the books of both Old and New Testament. As a poor kid in a quite wealthy neighborhood, third of four children living with a grandmother who had already raised four sons of her own, I found great comfort in scripture passages that spoke of God's care for widows and orphans for outsiders and for the poor. This is a passage that I memorized. I, I enjoyed it a lot and I, I puzzled over it. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. I really wanted to know, what is good? What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? My church tradition spent lots of time debating things like whether it was okay to go to movie theaters. It was not. Um, whether it was okay to chew gum, maybe when you were a teenager. Whether it was okay to play cards, not face type playing cards, but things like Uno were acceptable. This passage seemed to sweep those questions away. I wondered then, and I've wondered since, what does it mean to do justice? I loved the idea then that by doing justice and loving kindness, we could learn to walk with God. That's what I wanted to do. And that's what I still want to do. I was 12 when Martin Luther King died, and I remember hearing his I Have a Dream speech replaying on the radio. I lived in a racially diverse community. Um, it was tense. Um, it was during the civil rights period, and there were people who did not like Martin Luther King and did not like to hear him use scripture in a political way. Some adults I knew were offended by that speech and by the, the use of the book of Amos in that speech. I was puzzled by that, and I'm still puzzled. The book of Amos is excel, itself a highly political book. Amos himself was, was not a priest, he was not a king, he was not a leader, he was a shepherd and a grower of figs. But God called him to proclaim judgment on the nations surrounding Israel and then on Israel itself for valuing money and things more than people, for failing to provide justice for the poor. From what I read in the prophetic books, God holds nations accountable for their treatment of the poor the outsider, the daily wage worker struggling to get by. In my high school years, my family ended up homeless twice. I went to three different high schools staying for periods of time with other families. It was a conflicted and confusing time. I heard some Christians talk harshly against what they called the social gospel. I saw others live such deep hospitality I still am moved to tears at the memory of their kindness. I heard plenty of people talk about faith in ways that left a bad taste in my mouth and made me consider many times walking away. But I also saw a loving few living the kind of faith described in these verses. People who shared their bread with the hungry, who invited the homeless in and treated them like family, who went to great lengths to cover the frailty and weakness of others. I don't remember ever being interested in politics. I studied English in college, went to grad school planning to teach, took 10 years off to stay home with my children, and then when I went back to teaching, discovered my priorities had changed and I became a full-time youth pastor instead at the Church of the Good Samaritan here. 
As part of my job, I was given the task of overseeing a program called UrbanServe, a partnership between our church and a parish in Kensington, one of the poorest communities in Philadelphia and in the state. At the end of my time on youth staff, my last urban serve, the city was building a new elementary school to replace a dangerously outdated building. We had noticed that the children we worked with had very little access to books, and the books that we would bring from here, used books, would vanish very quickly. Some of our kids said, what if we started gathering books to give to their school library? And that seemed like a great idea. I mentioned it to a few people, and before I knew it, I had boxes of books piling up in my garage. So I started calling to find out where I could deliver them. When I finally got hold of somebody, I was told the school would not have a library. I, I asked several times. I had trouble understanding that message. How could an elementary school not have a library? There was no staffing. There was no funding. There was no budget. I've since learned that most elementary schools in Philly do not have school libraries because they do not have budget for staffing. How is it possible that in a city with the first free library in the country, the state rich in colleges and universities, how is it possible that such a place could not provide libraries for its poorest, most at-risk kids? As a child myself, I lived in my school library. I dreamed in my school library. My school library was an avenue to someplace different. I know firsthand how important books can be to lifting kids out of poverty. How can it be that we allow elementary schools in our city not to have school libraries? I've since learned that Pennsylvania has the most inequitable school funding in the country. The margin of difference is twice the U.S. average, almost twice that of the next most inequitable state, Vermont. We have one of the lowest state contributions to education in the country, which is why we depend so heavily on real estate tax, on property tax, which is why some of our older citizens have trouble keeping up, but which is also why it's so inequitable. Areas that are able to have a high property tax have well-funded schools, as many of the schools in this area are, and areas that are not able to have a high property tax, as in poor neighborhoods in Philadelphia, have very low school funding. My attempt to understand this inequity led me into involvement with the local League of Women Voters. I was looking for a nonpartisan group that understood policy and had ideas for how to change it, because it seemed to me to love those kids, as I did, to love my neighbor meant trying to understand how to make sure that they had what they needed in their schools. School funding was an issue that drove me into looking at policy and that led me into focusing towards politics. But my continued friendship with children and families from Kensington also forced my attention to other issues. I'll mention one, homelessness. I spent time with low-income single moms who could not find adequate housing for their families, despite working full-time. For people working a minimum wage, the average rent anywhere in our state is out of reach. While other states have found ways to address this, and the national homeless rate has been shrinking, in Pennsylvania, the homeless rate continues to climb. And a fourth of the homeless in our state are children. I like to understand things. I, my husband says I'm, in, I'm incurably curious. And the more I tried to understand, the more connections I saw between bad policies, unaccountable government, and our unresponsive electoral system. My exploration led me to look at policy, then into politics, looking at elections, and that led me to redistricting. It's a complicated topic. It only happens every 10 years. It's easy to ignore. But once you start connecting the dots, you can see that something needs to change. So, I'm going to start with some vocabulary. First, reapportionment. Following every national census, the seats in Congress need to be redistributed across the states. There are 435 seats. If one state grows in population, it should get another seat. If a state 
loses population relative to the others, it should lose a seat. Pennsylvania has been le losing at least one seat every 10 years. Uh, the seats tend to go south or west, and that's reapportionment. So we, last time we went from 19 to 18 seats. After the next census, it's pretty much guaranteed we'll be going from 18 to 17. So word number one, reapportionment. Word two, redistricting. So after the seats are reapportioned, then the states have to keep population even within those districts. And so they have to redraw the district lines to, to do that. So if we go from 18 to 17, from 19 to 18, those district lines need to be redrawn. The con congressional districts, the, the lines that govern our elections for the House of Representatives, those are done as a simple bill. So the majority party introduces a piece of legislation, it's voted on in both houses, it goes to the governor, it's signed. If one, major, if one party has a majority in both houses and has the governor, that party controls the process completely without any check on it. Now, our state legislative districts for the state Senate and House are done by a different process. That's five people. So each legislative leader chooses somebody else, usually the majority or minority leader in their house, so that gives you four. And then those four are supposed to agree on a fifth person. If they can't, the, the Supreme, state Supreme Court chooses the fifth person. Those five people draw the district lines for all their colleagues and themselves. Which brings us to our next word. Gerrymandering. Gerrymandering is manipulation of district lines for personal or partisan advantage. If five people are drawing the lines that govern their own elections and the elections of their colleagues, they can do all sorts of things to make sure that they stay elected and to make sure the people they don't like do not get reelected. The name was coined in 1812 when Governor Elbridge Gerry of Massachusetts signed off on a bill that looked, it was a map a voting map that looked like a salamander. And so that's where the name came from. They put his name Jerry with the salamander. It's been gerrymander ever since. And it's a deep conflict of interest. It's a little bit like allowing the eagles to choose the umpire? No, referee. Um, I, I don't do football. Um, it's a little, little bit like allowing them to decide what the, what, the, what the end zone would be, that they can start very close to the end zone and the other team has to go a long distance. Not just for one game, but for the next 10 years of games. That's what it's a little bit like. It's a conflict of interest. Think about the way lines are drawn. So this is a kind of classic example. Um, if, you, if you look at the one on the left, you could have a population that's 60% blue, 40% red. So go to number one there, then the next one over. If you drew the lines in a particular way, you could end up with perfectly proportional representation. Three districts blue, two districts red, perfect proportion. If, the, if blue controlled the, the line drawing process though, blue could, could take all those districts simply by drawing the lines. You see that in the third one over? Blue can just take the whole thing. If they have control of the districting process, they can take a complete majority. If red somehow had gotten control of drawing the lines, even though they're the minority with 40%, if they drew the lines well, they could end up with the majority of legislators. See that? That's gerrymandering. Now, the thing I don't like about that is it assumes that the whole game is between two parties, and that's what matters, which party wins. And we hear it from a lot of people, oh, you're just trying to flip things because right now the Republicans are in control in Pennsylvania and you want the Democrats to be in control. That is completely not the case. It's about people. What we're trying to say is elections should be about people. They should not be about parties, they should be about people. So think about the fact that within either party, you have people who are, they will always vote full party ticket. That's what they're gonna do. And then there are people who kind of lean that way, but they're looking at the issues, and they're listening to the candidates, and they're trying to figure out, what do you really think? What are you really gonna do? Then there are people who are unaffiliated voters, who have decided, I'm not gonna sign on with either party, I have problems with both, I'm an independent, we have Green Party, we have Libertarian Party, Pennsylvania has a Prohibition Party. They do, it's still in existence, it's been around a long time. Now imagine you had a population like that, that was kind of heavily red and blue, but had some other folks mixed in, and you drew the lines the way they're drawn there. Who would your candidates be speaking to when they ran for election? They'd be speaking to everybody. 
You would, have to build, you would have to build some kind of confidence with a majority of voters. You could not just appeal to the far edges of either red or blue. You'd have to appeal to the middle to be elected. Now, you could take that same population and draw the lines differently. A sweetheart gerrymander is one where both parties collude to create safe districts for themselves and really shut out the voters' voice. So if you look at the top and the bottom districts there, those are safe districts. So the party could just say, here's your candidate, and, and you don't really get a choice. And we have many, 86% of our legislative races in the, last, in the last election had no opposition in the primary, and 50% of those had no opposition in the general election. If you draw districts like that, that's what you end up with. You're simply given your, you're given your legislator, you really have no choice. Now in this, because I'm not a particularly good gerrymanderer, the middle district there, is a swing district. You'd still have a district where people have to appeal to the voter. Our parties have managed to draw those off the map. We have very few swing areas anywhere, either in Congress or our state legislature, any longer because the maps are drawn so carefully. Now there's two other ways that people talk about gerrymandering. One is cracking. And that's splitting a population and spreading its members across districts so they become an irrelevant minority. My graphics are not great, but you can see in that map what happens. And if you go across Pennsylvania, especially our house districts, you'll see all of our small cities or denser towns split. They're cracked out. So here, this is Beaver Falls, um, and it's a, it's a poor post-industrial um, pretty dense, fairly democratic community. It's been split into four different house districts. And look at the one that goes actually through Beaver Falls and then just keeps going. That was very, very carefully done to make sure that community has no voice. That's cracking. Now another thing is packing, and that's when you concentrate voters of one party in as few districts as possible to reduce their influence in the remaining districts. And they've been packed so that the, the margin is so high that the Republicans in those districts should, why even bother? Um, there's, no, there's no competitiveness at all. That's very deliberate. So you can see this is District 1. It should be a Philly district, and there's actually Republicans in Philly. This is done very carefully to skirt the Republican areas of Philly and wander out into the areas around Philly to capture Democrats from those areas so they don't infiltrate the, the districts surrounding them. That's packing. Now gerrymandering has been going on a long time and people say, why are you thinking about this now? Well, in large part because gerrymandering has changed, as we said. Think of what you can do with your phones now in terms of mapping though. Mapping has changed. Data technology has changed. The kinds of information that can be stored about you and then matched up to a map has changed. So now it's possible to go through census block by census block and predict what each census block will do in each election. Presidential elections, off-year elections, all that information is available and all that information is used. So we just, just this week, um, somebody came out with the evidence of what, we're call, what is being called the Terzai uh, production data. This data was used in drawing our congressional district maps. So neighborhood by neighborhood, somebody went through and identified, predicted what each block would do and then drew the lines to be able to predict what the outcome would be and then divided the map up very carefully to give a margin of victory to one party. Now, let me say again, this is a nonpartisan discussion. Both parties do this. The Democrats did a really good job with their tools available in Pennsylvania in 1991. In 2001, the Republicans said, oh really? And they did an even better job. In 2010, Karl Rove wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal, which really startled me when I came across it. I spend time online looking for things and I found this online and I said, is this, legal? Is this okay? He wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal that said, he who controls redistricting can control Congress. And if you look at the first words in that paragraph, it says, in Pennsylvania in 2001. We were the poster child for a wonderful idea of why don't we do that across the country, go after state legislative districts, capture the state legislatures. You can, you can pour a little bit of money into a state house race 
And if you message well, you can get really good people out of office just by saying, this person voted for this thing and make it sound like an awful terrible thing. And voters don't know. They get those slick mailers. They say, ooh, I didn't know that. So it's very easy to swing a, swing a state legislative race for not much money, and that's exactly what happened. Red Map 2010, um, Republicans really targeted a handful of states, um, and Pennsylvania was their, their, their best victory. Um, in the next round, 2020, we know that both parties are stockpiling millions that they're going to be targeting towards just a handful of states. And why, why would we be one of those? Well, we are of great interest, number one, because we are one of the states guaranteed to, to lose a seat. So that means everything's redrawn, congressional districts are redrawn. We're also one of the three remaining real swing states, Illinois, Florida, and Pennsylvania. We are a target for any money that's going to be thrown towards this to control state legislatures, to con control Congress. We're right in the middle of this, this story. Now, when I started, when we started on this two years ago, we knew Pennsylvania was, was bad, but we didn't really have a way to measure. People have been doing a lot of work on how do you measure? How do you show what's happening with gerrymandering? And what we've discovered is Pennsylvania is the worst in the country. So by, there's five, there's currently five measures that are, are being used. By two of those measures, we are the worst. And by a long, I mean, the, the difference is pretty stark how much worse we are than some others. Um, and then in the other measures, we're among the worst five. The only other state that's among the worst five is Michigan, and they're down fourth or fifth on all the different measurements. Now remember, this is not about which party gets the most votes, although that matters. It's about whose voices are heard, but it's also what policy gets enacted. And do you have any say in what policy gets enacted? So I talked about cracking and how our more urban communities are cracked, our small cities are cracked, and across the state that's the case. This is a, a picture of Allentown. That's another city that ties with Reading as being one of the most underfunded school districts in the country. So Allentown is divided into three house districts. It ought to have somebody who is thinking only about Allentown. Instead, it's a piece and the least important piece of three districts. On the western side of the state, this is the thing that I find interesting. Uh, Lawrence, if you can look at that. It's, it's got some weirdness going on. It's actually got a piece of the district that isn't connected, which is actually illegal. Um, they're supposed to be contiguous. There are pieces across the state that are not contiguous at all. And then Slippery Rock, I actually spoke at Slippery Rock. Slippery Rock is a university town, and you've got to crack those out or they're going to have some kind of say. So that's cracked out very nicely. So that weirdness going on is Slippery Rock, just divided up nicely. In our area, in my area, here, here in Chester County area, you, we have lots of examples of, of communities that are just cracked, cracked right out, divided up. Phoenixville is one, Norristown is one, um, Westchester is another. Um, we could go across the map and actually our, our legislators had never seen, they had never seen a full map of house districts. All they have seen is their own, they know their own districts, but they don't know the full thing. So we made four by six banner maps of our state House and Senate districts and take them to Harrisburg and stand them up in the rotunda regularly and have wonderful conversations with legislators who did not know, who did not, who have never seen what's been done to this beautiful state of Pennsylvania. But that has, that has an impact on policy. So we talked about school districts. It has an impact on ha affordable housing. There are, I, could go, I could go on a long time to tell you the ways that this impacts policy. I'll give you one more specific example and then a kind of general uh, point about this. Lead, lead poisoning. We've all heard about Flint, Michigan and the lead poisoning in the water. I don't know if you know, but there are 18 cities in Pennsylvania that have far worse lead poisoning than Flint, Michigan. It's not in the water, it's in the air because these are cities with older housing and older buildings and they're all painted with lead paint and every time you open a window or a door, there's lead dispersed into the air. So we have 18 cities, far worse. You can see there's a, a kind of a little faint blue line there. Do you see it? That's Flint. That's how the lead poisoning in Flint. We are far, far worse 
than that. But for comparison, the lead exposure rate in Flint is 3.21%, which is toxic to children especially. Um, in York, it's 12.41. Lebanon, it's 12.91. If you could see this well, you'd see that all of these cities have at least four times the level of lead exposure that Flint does. It's difficult to compare Pennsylvania as a state, though, because we don't have mandatory testing. Most states do. And you would think a state where this has turned out to be a serious problem would immediately, immediately the legislature would say, we need to do mandatory testing of children at these ages so we can catch this early and make sure it's remediated. Pennsylvania has not done that. Flint reminded people that lead when ingested or inhaled by small children can permanently damage IQ and can cause a lifetime of developmental and behavioral problems. That's a huge economic cost when you think about the services that those children will need. It's been proven that every dollar spent in lead control, lead hazard control remediation, is a savings of about $221. That's a huge investment in the future. But to do that, you'd have to have a legislature that's paying attention. So we've had, there are bills introduced, there are quite a few bills right now in Harrisburg. In the, there are over 2,030 bills right now in the legislature this session in Harrisburg. A tiny fraction of those will ever be considered. And things like this, that's a city problem and no one's really thinking about it. It will not be considered, it will not be voted on, it will not be enacted. This problem will continue. And we could go through list after list of, of problems that face citizens of Pennsylvania, and there's not enough interest, there's not enough political will, and certainly in, in Harrisburg, there's not enough attention to correct those. The last policy thing I want to talk about is that there's a group called the Economy League that we've been in conversation with that has done reports on the economic health across the state. They just recently re released a report saying that for 24 years, Pennsylvania's health and economic competitiveness has been decaying. And according to them, they've been warning about this for years. They've made policy recommendations that have been completely ignored. Little has been done by the state since a call 10 years ago for systemic change. The report describes the ways our municipalities are formed, structured, and governed by state statutes. Over 6,000 statutes, some dating back to 1803, and many of them not looked at for over 50 years. There are groups across the state that have asked and asked and asked to have those things reviewed and addressed. All kinds of issues that could be, could be resolved and not necessarily even at any cost of money. Simply review, recommendation, and enactment of good policy. Is that going to happen? Not in our current political state. When I first started learning about this less than three years ago, it had not occurred to me that loving my neighbor would lead me into the political arena. Loving my neighbor meant buying a bag of groceries for a friend who was short of cash at the end of the month, or inviting a friend from Kensington to bring her children to spend a weekend at my house so they could play in the grass or swing on our hammock. But in December 2015, I found myself on a conference call with some people who had been studying gerrymandering in Pennsylvania for years. And I realized, if we don't do something, if studying is not enough, if we don't do something, we will never be able to advocate successfully on other issues of importance. I found myself suggesting we convene a meeting and put together a coalition and create a visible entity to change things. So in January 2016, the Pennsylvania Council of Churches Advocacy hosted a meeting of organizational representatives. I was there representing the League of Women Voters of Pennsylvania, Barry Kaufman representing Common Cause PA, and we co-founded Fair Districts PA. We agreed on some priorities. Top of them would be assign the redistricting power to an independent commission of which neither the commissioners or members of their, their immediate families or government or party officials can be part of it. And to ensure transparency in that process and opportunities for public participation. We chose two bills to support in that session. One had been introduced by Senator Boscola from the Lehigh Valley. She is very fiercely opposed to gerrymandering because she was almost X'd off the map as a, as a representative. Xing off the map is when you vote the way you think you should and the leadership tells you not to. 
The next time there's redistricting, they will make sure you're punished. And the way they do it is just draw your district someplace else. And there you are. Um, so she has, she, she said, oh, you're going to X me off? I'll run for senator instead. And she's up against the Delaware River, so they have a hard time moving her district away. And she's um, been pretty fierce about wanting to address this. The other legislator, the, the bill we supported in the House, was introduced by Representative David Parker at the time, who is a man of faith and who got involved in politics because of the inequitable school funding in Allentown, which he represented. Um, so as a Republican, as a Christian, as someone who cared about education, he looked at school funding and then he saw himself looking at gerrymandering and saying, we can't fix that unless we fix the way that our elections work. So we supported those bills. They did not get a hearing. They did not get enacted. Um, but we continue to work towards redistricting reform. Um, and this session, so I was actually very privileged to be involved in drawing the, the bill that we now support. So at the end of the last session when the bills we supported were not, were dead, um, Senator Boscola's staff pulled together a group of policy folks, representatives and senators from both parties, and a group of advocates to sit down, look at what we'd learn, and write a new bill. So the Senate Bill 22 is that bill. Um, we all had some say in writing it. And then House Bill 722 is the counterpart in, in the House. Senate Bill 22 now has 17 co-sponsors. Uh, a third of them are, rep are Republicans, the others are Democrats. And House Bill 722 now has 104 co-sponsors. So it has the most co-sponsors of any bill in the House in this session. It has more than a majority, and a third of those folks are Republican and two-thirds are Democrats. Both of them are stuck in committee. And we are trying to figure out, how do you move things in a legislature where the leadership does not want things to move? The bills themselves would create an independent commission that would have uh, pools of candidates. Um, those would not be allowed to be elected officials. There's a process of selection. I won't go into that in detail, but if you're interested, we've got lots of information on our website that describes the bills in great detail. And we've actually got some training videos on our YouTube channel that tell how to read a bill, because if you don't know how to read a bill and you try to read it, you can get very confused. And we've had lots of great conversation with legislators across the past year about why this needs to change, how these, this commission would work. To get things changed, of this, this is actually in the state constitution, how the legislative districts are drawn. So this would be a constitutional amendment, which means it has to go through the legislature in two consecutive sessions and then go to public referendum. When we started this and said, this is what we wanted to do, everybody I talked to said, that's a heavy lift. I got tired of hearing it. That's a heavy lift. But the other thing they would say is, reform is not possible in Pennsylvania. And I would say, not possible. And they would say, it's not possible. You don't have initiative and referendum. You have leaders who will never give up power. And you have citizens who will never pay attention. So is that true? Um, we're working against a timeline. Um, the next census begins April 1st of 2020. And the next redistricting happens April 1st, 2021. So this has to pass in this session to be able to go through the next session and then go to referendum before this. So we have a kind of a little schedule of, of what this looks like. We, we know we're on a tight timeline. Um, it's a complicated effort. And the question has been, will legislative leaders give up power and will citizens pay attention? What we've discovered is that citizens will pay attention. Look at you, you're here. You're paying attention, you're thinking about this, and we're glad that you're here. We, we started out two years ago um, with a handful of meetings. The most attendance was 100, and then suddenly people started looking at elections and thinking, is this really working for us? Are we really happy with where we're going? People from across the political spectrum started looking at elections and saying, are we okay? Is our democracy okay? Or do we need to pay attention? Are there things that need to be fixed? So we have, we have been gaining volunteers at a really fast pace. Um, we have volunteers who have been meeting with legislators. Um, we have volunteers who've been petitioning, uh, getting people to sign petitions as you might have done as you came in at festivals, fairs, polling places. 
We have volunteers collecting signatures at senior centers or at rallies or at colleges. Um, we have people writing postcards by the thousands. Um, and some they mail and some they deliver in person. Some they do creative things like this, which stapled a thousand postcards to a board, which has a picture of our beautiful District 7. Um, we've been having people introduce resolutions across the state in more than 13 counties and 140 municipalities. We have people just show up in their local government to say, we are harmed by this and we want it changed and we want our local municipality to pass a resolution saying, change this to our, to our state government to say, please, change this. We want citizens' voices to be heard. And we have had meetings across the state. Um, we've had over 30, 350 meetings at this point with over 18,000 people showing up. We've had meetings in bars, in restaurants, in libraries, in rotaries, in community centers, in private homes, all kinds of meetings. Citizens are paying attention and citizens are eager to have this change. We want our state to thrive. We want our voices to be heard. So here's the question, what is your role in this? What could you do to help? I don't know. I don't know who you are. I don't know who you know. I don't know what your time is or what your skill set is. But I would ask you to be praying. Is this something God wants you to engage in? If it is, please join us. If it's not, no worries and no guilt. But beyond that, beyond the question of gerrymandering, here's a question that really, really troubles me. What are we doing? What are people of faith doing without labeling people who have different points of view, without assuming our own party is right, without assuming the other person is wrong? How, what are we doing to be peacemakers in this space, to open up space for real conversation? One of the things that I love about the work that I'm doing is that Fair Districts PA has, we, we now have a volunteer list of over 4,000 people. So every two weeks I send an email to over 4,000 people. And everywhere I go, I bump into people who say, oh, I love, I get, I get your emails, thank you. Actually, our, our regular update email list, which I also write, goes to over 22,000 people and just tells people what's happening, what we're doing, why it matters. What I love is that we are across the political spectrum. We are endorsed by the Libertarian Party and I have conversations regularly with representatives of that party. We are endorsed by lots of progressive groups. We're endorsed by third party, different groups. Um, we have folks from teens through their 80s. We might have some folks in their 90s. We're across the state. We're rural. We're urban. And the wonderful thing is we're working together and talking together and putting our differences aside. Sometimes folks tease each other a little bit because they know where they're coming from, but in a, in a really gentle and sweet way. And we, we monitor our Facebook pages. We monitor those keep carefully to keep them civil and polite and positive and productive, to have conversation about things that matter instead of just saying, oh, you're one of them. We can never talk to you. So to me, that's a question for us as people of faith. How do we open up space to have real conversations about things that matter, to solve real problems? And the last thing I'd like to ask you is can you pray? I mean, can you pray for me? I need it every day, all day. But can you pray for Fair Districts PA? Because honestly, will legislative leaders give up power? We still don't know. And if it was easy, it would have been done decades ago. We've got a, the, the, some days I get a glimpse of how addictive power is. And I get a glimpse of some of the people who are deeply addicted to power and how manipulative and duplicitous and dangerous they can be. Some days I get a glimpse and it scares me. Some days I get a glimpse and I think, what am I doing? <laughs> um, and then some days I get a glimpse that God is at work too. God is at work more. God is at work before and around and above. And that's the only way this changes is if, if God intervenes on our behalf and moves those legislative leaders to allow these bills to move forward because they have complete control um, and it's, it's been frightening to see how locked down our legislature is. And it's been interesting to be there on days when things happen and legislators come to me and say, you have to do something. And I think, you're the legislators. And they make incredibly clear they can't. The leadership has incredible power and control. And the average legislator in Harrisburg has none.
So unless God shakes things and moves things, we don't have a way forward. So I invite you to be praying for this, for our effort, for our state, for our democracy, for our conversations with each other. We're in an important time, and it's important to be aware, and it's important to be praying. There are a couple of questions that come up. I'm going to answer them, but there's going to be time later for more questions. One is lawsuits are the answer. There have been three lawsuits on this this year. Uh, two in federal court, one in state superior court. The state superior court one was successful. It's being appealed. This is an ongoing, messy process. Are lawsuits the answer? We would love to see fair districts drawn for the next congressional race, but we also know that it's a bit of chaos in terms of timing. And whatever happens, lawsuits are not the solution. They might be a short-term remedy, a short-term partial remedy. The long-term full solution is an independent commission drawing both congressional districts and state house and senate districts. So lawsuits, important to call attention, important to show what's going on, a piece of the puzzle, but not the only long-term solution. I'm gonna leave that slide up. It just shows ways to get engaged. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for being part of this conversation.